Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Steve Pulse. He's going to tell a great story about meeting John Prine. I went to Ireland in 1988, and I was playing on the streets. So I was just over there busking. I was busking all around Europe. And I had this job where I was a nipple salesman in San Diego. So I graduated from USD, and there was a plastics factory that was advertising. So I needed to get a job, and my parents said to me, you know, when you graduate, I never forgot this. They took me out to dinner to tell me this. When you graduate, you can't move back home. And in my mind, I was thinking, well, I don't want to move back home. That's the last place I want to go, but thank you for saying that. Because, And I was really happy they said it because it almost gave me permission to cut the cord. My parents always made me feel pretty loved. And so I am I was fortunate, you know, a lot of people don't have that. And I was going to USD and there was a place where they would put up jobs where they're interviewing people. And so it said plastic salesman. And I just thought, I have a degree in political science with a minor in Spanish. What, what am I going to even do? So I, on stage, I sometimes say, I have a degree in political science with a minor in Spanish. So I knew I wouldn't have a job, but at least I'd know why. And so I go there to the interview with this guy. And uh, I had eaten a bunch of magic mushrooms the night before with these two girls, Kiara and Elizabeth. They were my neighbors. And we ended up in a bathtub. And I was in my underwear and I was putting toothpaste on my legs and they were shaving stripes down the sides of my legs with a razor. And then I had them get a dozen eggs out of my refrigerator and break them over my head. And then we spray painted the walls and I just went nuts. And then my roommate, Daryl, came home and he said, hey, you got to go to this job interview. And I went to the job interview and it was like all of a sudden I had eaten more mushrooms at like three in the morning because they hadn't kicked in high enough. And I was tripping so heavily talking to this guy because it was like an 8 a.m. interview. His name's Tom Plain. And it was like I became Tony Robbins or something. Or Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I'm talking to him. He ends up going, shut up. Just stop talking. And he writes down a number. He goes, I don't even know where you've been, but this is exactly what I'm looking for. I need you to do sales. And he hands me a piece of paper. It's 1985, and he writes down 17.5, and he's offering me a salary. And he slides it across the table, just like they would do in the movies. And I have no clue what 17.5 means, and he hands me a pen. So I scratch out 17.5, and I don't know what game we're playing. I write down 14.2, because I'm tripping. I hand it back to him. He goes, why would you take less? And I said, and then I realized, I was like, oh. And I go, because I want less. He goes, why do you want less? I said, because I want more. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I want more in the back end. I want a percentage. I believe in what I'm doing. And I don't need a lot up front. I will make you money. And he just goes, you have the job. And I said, can I have a company car? And he goes, yeah. And he hands me the keys. And I go, can I pick it up on Monday? Because he wanted me to start. <laughs> so I go... And uh, so I work for him, and I read this book called The Razor's Edge by William Somerset Maugham, and he's a great author. Maugham is spelled M-A-U-G-H-M. Fantastic. I think he's a British author, maybe, or maybe American. I can't remember. And uh, in the book, the protagonist goes to bum around Europe, and this book really affected me. Like, I can't tell you how much it affected me and all I thought about was the protagonist and how he quit his job and went and bummed around Europe and how everybody said you're just going to be a bum and so after three years of working for this guy selling nipples I was a nipple salesman a pipe nipple PVC plastic and we'd have these meetings like a nipple is like and you could have a six long inch nipple half by six and all that and you screw a sprinkler head on top of it so it was like the clock was going backwards, like in Ferris Bueller's day off when I'd be at work. And I just go, I got, this is killing me. So I went and talked to my boss and I said, I need a little time off. And he said, how much time do you need, a week? And I said, no, nine months. And he was like, clicked at me, he goes, you're crazy. Why? And I said, I wanna play my guitar on the streets. Where? Europe. And he, and he actually said, like a bum? <laughs> and that made me so happy. And I go, yeah, like a bum. And he goes, 
you know what? You are so crazy. I'm going to give you your nine months. I'll give you it, but you have to make me a promise. I said, all right, anything. He goes, promise me after nine months, you will come back and work for me again. You have to do that, and I'll give you nine months off, and your job will be waiting. And I, he said, handshake deal. Reached my hand over, I shook his hand. So I went to Europe. So I'm playing on the streets. I end up going over to Ireland. I end up in this town called Tralee, where they do the Rose of Tralee. They crown the girl the Rose of Tralee. And there was a busker's festival happening outside. And I was a busker. So I just set up and started playing. And these three Irish dudes walked by. And I don't even know what I was playing, but they threw money in my case and they liked me. And then they said, do you need a place to stay? And I said, yeah, I do. And they said, you can come stay at our house because that's how it is. You know, when you take a leap of faith, and you, there's always going to be a net, but you don't know how far down the net's going to be. But you take a leap of faith, and hopefully something good happens. Well, something good happened. So I go to their house. It's 1988. They have all these vinyl records, and they go to work every day. They leave me to have the run of their house. What do I do? I just start going through their vinyl records every day and learning songs. What did they have? Every John Prine album up till 1988. So I don't know what the discography would be, but all I know is I fell in love with Diamonds in the Rough and they had that on vinyl, which is still to this day, probably my favorite John Prine record. There's something about it and um, it's just got this raw energy. Not that I don't like his later stuff, I love everything, but Diamonds in the Rough captures him at this moment. And I would put that record on. You know, we didn't have Google. You can just look up and get a YouTube lesson for, you know, how to play a certain song. And I would put the vinyl on, fall in love with a certain song, and then start going, I come home from work this evening. There was a note in a frying pan. It said, fix your own supper, babe. I run off with the Fuller Brush Man. And I was like, this, that to me was pure poetry. Like, it got me so excited. It was like the craziest thing. Reading that, and I remember thinking, who writes this? John Prine is speaking to me. It was like, it didn't, all the money in the world, you could take anything Elon Musk had, Bill Gates, uh, Jeff Bezos, anything, but none of them could do that. And that, to me, was the holy grail. So then I fell in love with John Prine. Obviously, I knew who he was prior to that, but I didn't do the deep dive. So I come back to the United States. I go back, and I get my job again. My hair is long. My boss is looking, you got to cut your hair. And I go back, and I'm a man of my word. I, I really told him I was going to do it, and I worked for him for a few more years. And then... Um, I said, okay, I've done my time. I went till 1992, worked for him for another two to three years. And then the Rugburns got a record deal, traveled all around, and I always thought about John Prine, and I thought, I'm never going to meet John Prine. I end up getting a record deal with Mercury Universal, and then I start coming to Nashville, and I would play some shows. Well, it just so happens one night, this guy, Al Bonetta, comes to my show. He goes, Steve. You would love, John Prime would love you. You got to meet him. You guys would get along great. I want you to meet him. Every time I came to Nashville, John Prime's out of town, but I would go to Albanetta's house. I think it was called um, something frog or sleepy something frog. I can't remember, but yeah, that guy made a lot of money off John Prime. Just put it this way. <laughs> Albanetta would, could charm, he could take money from anybody and make you feel good about it. <laughs> Even though, and I don't like to speak ill of the day because I he cracked me up, but this guy had the golden tongue. <laughs> and so I would go over to Albanetta's house. He had adopted a Russian kid named Yuri who unfortunately died. Um, but, uh, and Albanetta would make me lunch. He would always come to my shows, always kept in touch with me. And I never got to meet John Prine. One day I'm in San Diego where I lived. I go surfing. I get out of the water. I got like a nine foot board. It was a perfect day. There was a swell coming in from Mexico and I would surf at this place called Little Point that had a perfect left. And if you're goofy foot surfer, that means your right foot's forward and your left foot's back. Picture yourself on a skateboard. So your right foot, normally people, their left foot's forward. So if your right foot's forward, 
That's called goofy foot. Now, if you're goofy foot, you want a wave that goes to the left because you're facing the curl of the wave as it breaks and you're surfing and it's just like this beautiful thing rather than backsiding it. So there's a place that had a perfect left called Little Point. I get out of the water, throw my board in my Volkswagen van. I had a, a VW Euro van, Westfalia camper. And I get home, my answering machine light's blinking and I know John Prine's in town that night playing at a, at a beautiful place, Spreckles Theater, and it's sold out. And the message is Alban and he goes, Steve, John Prine's in town tonight. Give me a call. And I go, oh, he's going to offer me tickets. This is so cool. <laughs> so I call up Alban and the phone. He goes, Steve, thanks for calling me back. He goes, John Prine's in town. And I go, I know. It's sold out. And he goes, oh, that's too bad. He goes, listen. Um, <laughs> and my heart just sinks. And I just thought, oh, I don't know what he wants. Okay. I go, I'm not going to get tickets. But that's cool. I'm not going to beg him for them. And so he goes, listen, can you do me a favor? And I go, yeah, what do you need? He goes, can you pick John Prine up at his hotel and take him to the Disney store? Dude, If you know how Snoopy would do the Snoopy dance where his ears go up and he's flying in the air? That was me. I was Snoopy. I was trying to control my energy and not get overboard and queer the deal where he goes, wait, this could be a possible stalker. So I go, yeah, my voice got high. If you were an FBI profiler, all the lights would have gone off. I went, yeah, I can get him. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so sure enough, um, I go, where's he staying? He goes, oh, he's at the Horton Grand Hotel. Well, in my mind, we didn't have Google Maps back then, right? And in my mind, I'm triangul triangulating it in my, the map of my mind because I know San Diego really well. And I go, Horton Grand Hotel is right across the street from Horton Plaza. Horton Plaza is where the Disney store is. Because Albanetta says, I need you to take him to the Disney store to pick up toys for his kids because it's the end of his tour and he needs to bring toys home to Tommy and Jack. And so I go, yeah. So I go down and I don't tell Al he can walk across the street. John can walk across the street to the Disney store. I go, I'm going to get him in my van. And I'll drive down, I'll pick him up at his hotel and I'll get on the freeway and I'll come up the back way. John's not gonna know, he's not from San Diego. Nobody's gonna know and I'll go to the underground garage, lead him into the Disney store. No one will be any the wiser on that. So I go down to pick John Prine up. I just gotten out of the water and, and Al needs me to do this right away. So I got my board shorts on, I'm dripping wet, there's sand on me, I'm wearing flip flops. I had just driven through Roberto's, Rigoberto's, got six rolled tacos with guacamole and a bean burrito, and you can stick the, the rolled tacos in the bean burrito and the crunch with the beans and the cheese and the guacamole. I'm eating them because I'm starving because I've been surfing. I got John Prine CDs in my van, all these CDs, it's a mess. Just like what you would think a musician surfer's van's gonna look like. Melted surf wax. So sure enough, I pull down to pick John Prine up, he comes out. He opens the door of my van and out on the ground, sweet revenge, John Prine CD drops on the ground with a bean burrito on it and it's cracked. <laughs> and he looks at it and he picks it up. <laughs> There's melted beans on John Prine's face where he's on sweet revenge. And he, he gets in the van and he goes, I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> So I get on 5 South and I start driving. Now the whole problem is I'm so excited because I got John Prine in my van. I forget what I'm even doing. I'm so nervous. I'm just saying John Prine's in my van. I'm trying not to go overboard, but I'm talking to him. Next thing you know, when you're in San Diego, you're 20 minutes from Mexico, right? From Tijuana. So I'm just driving down 5 South. All of a sudden a sign says, um, Tijuana, five miles. And John Prine goes, is the Disney store in Mexico? <laughs> and then I go, oh no, we're almost there. So then I get off of five south and I get on five north. Like John Prine has no sense of direction. He sees we're on five south and now we're on five north. And he goes, weren't we just on five south? <laughs> and I go, yeah, yeah, we're almost there. So then I get off, I go to the underground garage. I lead him into Horton Plaza, into the Disney store. And then he goes, I gotta call my wife Fiona real quick. Cause I can never remember who if I what I got my kids. I might have already gotten them. And he looks at me, and this is why he's John Prine. He goes, and they never forget. And I was just like, in my mind, I was going, that's why you're John Prine. Most people would say, I can't remember if I got them, so I'll call my wife. 
No, they never forget. Brutal. So then he gets on the phone and he's talking to Fiona. And then as he looks up, I see him look up and there's a sign blinking. It says Horton Grand Hotel. And I see the look on his face and he looks at me and he looks at the sign and he looks back at me and then he takes the phone and he goes like this and he goes, in that my hotel? <laughs> and I'm totally busted, so I don't know what to do. But I go, they must have moved it. But I said it seriously. <laughs> so now this ride that he thought he was with a nice guy has become a Stephen King novel. And this is like, I'm gonna take him home and hobble his knees and chain him to a bed and make him write me my own John Prine songs like Misery. So this is a full Stephen King novel. And he looks at me scared and he buys the toys for Tommy and Jack. And then he goes, are you gonna drive me back to my hotel? Or should I just walk so I don't end up in Mexico? <laughs> And then I go, get in the van, John. Like that, almost like it puts the lotion in the basket that, in that type of voice. And he goes, what? And I go, the van, get in the van, John. And then he goes, okay. And he gets in the van, like once bitten, twice shy, no. He gets in the van and I drive him through the underground garage and I drop him off at his hotel. And then he goes, are you coming to the show tonight? And I go, no, I, I don't have tickets, it's sold out. And he goes, now you do. And I go, let me give you my name. And he goes, I know who you are. Al warned me about you. <laughs> and then I go to the show that night and the tickets are front and center. And he walks out on stage and he sees me and he just goes, so yeah, I met John Prime once. <laughs>